Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has proved to be a challenging one on preparation for the end time. This is lesson number seven in that series for May 19 of 2018. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and Father, loving Father, as we consider these passages in Matthew 24 and 25, help us to gather what you want us to gather from this to realize that these are passages which those who are interested in the Advent have spent a lot of time studying. Help us to correctly represent them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of this series, this lesson, is in Matthew 24 and 25. And if you remember the setting, it's in the final week of Christ's life. It's Tuesday. He's making his last appearances, last appearance in the temple. He arrived early in the morning. He had conflicts with the, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And finally, he made some statements at the end. And then, as he was walking out, he said something about the temple. And his disciples wanted to ask questions about that. So when they got to the Mount of Olives, they were headed in that direction, headed east. And uh, they said, well, what about this? I mean, you said no stone left on another. What in the world are you talking about? And so during his last visit to the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus made the startling statement that not a single stone here will be left in its place. That was Matthew 24, verse 1. As soon as the disciples had an opportunity, they asked Jesus when these things would happen. Now, isn't that the question we would all want to know? In his answer, Jesus mingled the events connected with the destruction of Jerusalem with events that will happen as we approach the second coming of Jesus. But their purpose was not just to scare the disciples who would never see those final events in this earth's history, but rather to warn us how to prepare ourselves. In this lesson, we will try to see how the events affecting the Jewish nation uh, following the death of Jesus should help us to prepare for the final days just before us. So in addition to the traditional signs that have been given all the way back in the Old Testament in Joel, anybody know when Joel was written? Nobody knows for sure, but their estimates are around 790 B.C. The book of Joel was written. And it talks about the sun darkening and the moon turned to blood and the stars falling. And when do we think that's happening? Or happened? 19th century. 1855 to, I'm sorry, 1755 up until 19, 1833, wasn't it? We believe that these events are connected with the second coming. So, um, Satan knows that his time is up as we approach the end, and he will cause a terrible series of events to try to prevent Jesus' returning, Jesus's return in, from happening. So, we need to remember that the only prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled are those directly connected to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And maybe I should be more accurate and say the only prophecies in the Bible there are other people making prophecies. The only prophecies in the Bible not yet fulfilled are those, fulfilled are those coming connected with the second coming of Jesus. Well, now I have a question for you. Could a false prophet or a false Christ arise in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Well, they have. Already they have. have, yes. David Koresh, for one. Yes. Thing. Yeah. How about that? Where, would, where do you think Satan would most like to cause, like to, to cause problems and, and sow confusion? Wouldn't it be among those who are trying to prepare for the second coming? Absolutely. So how do we prepare ourselves? Well, Matthew 24, 1 to 25, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but these are the, these are the messages that Jesus left and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its building. Jesse said, you may well look at all these things. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. And uh, we already mentioned that. The troubles and persecutions, he talks about false Christs and false prophets coming, claiming to be messiahs. I have a point in there in verse 3. It says, as Jesus sat, the disciples said, tell us, when will these things come? And what will happen to show that this is the time for your coming and the end of the age? So it was the disciples that put the things together. Mm -hmm. Said, the temple is going to end be de demolished and that'll be the end 
the end of time and you're that, coming. That's what they believe. They believed at that point in time that if the temple gets destroyed, that's that that's the end of the world. I mean, you know, why would who what, what could possibly happen after that? And since Matthew was thinking that way when he wrote it, probably, mm -hmm. why wouldn't he put these things together? Yeah. Okay, so let's jump back to where we're going. Clearly, Jesus made it, told us that there are very difficult times coming as we approach the end. What do we call those really difficult times just before the end? Time of trouble. The, 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 the difficult times just before the second coming, the seven last plagues. plagues. We call them plagues, don't we? And that's not, vials. Not yeah, that in, in Revelation it could be called vials, yeah. That's not the kind of thing you look forward to, right? Well, Satan knows that as these things wind up and, and we get closer and closer and we see more and more of these signs happening, what does it mean to him? Time is running out. Time is running out, yeah. So he is determined to deceive, confuse, if possible to destroy God's faithful people. So Christ warns us. He warns us of the false of Christ and the false prophets coming. When we hear about such things, you know, I think Adventists in general have been, once in a while we hear a rumor of somebody somewhere trying to claim that he's Jesus or something. And we, we sort of smile and, yeah, okay, fine, isn't that funny? Believe it or not, the National Geographic magazine, and many of you know how opposed to Christianity the National Geographic is, in the August 27 issue, there was a complete article on self-styled messiahs. I don't know if they had any idea that they were talking about fulfilling the final steps. August the, 2017 is what you meant. What did I say, 27? 27. I'm sorry, 2017, thank you very much. Well, the important thing when we see such things happening is not to be deceived ourselves. Down through the ages, various things have happened which have caused people to think that the world was going to become a much better place. I mean, the Industrial Revolution and other things, people said, boy, we're, we're just, you know, wonderful things are going to happen. But that is not what Jesus predicted. In fact, we see that his predictions are being fulfilled every day. So what was, what's the purpose of Jesus sort of warning us? Is he trying to just scare us? Look at a couple of those verses. Matthew 24, 25, we'll take that one first. Listen, I have told you this before the time comes. But he doesn't tell us why there. So I have suggested we should look over in John chapter 13, verse 19, where it says, I tell you this now before it happens, same words basically, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. What does that mean? You will believe that I am God, right? That's the, the I am who I am. That's the that's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Yahweh. <coughs> and and uh, just a little while later, in chapter fourteen, verse twenty nine, he says, "I have told you this now before it all happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe." So, what's the purpose of prophecy? So, when you look when something happens, you can look back and say, "Hey, I was it was was foretold." God didn't. It, God wasn't taken by surprise. One more, John 16, verse 4, but I have told you this so that when the time comes for them to do these things, you will remember that I told you. So that's the real reason for prophecies. It isn't so we can maybe fill up, up tomorrow's newspaper in advance. Uh, that's not what Jesus was planning for. Um, it is never God's plan to leave his people in the dark. He always warns us in advance. Unfortunately, many of us are not aware of or choose to ignore the warnings. Careful Bible students have been aware for some time that there are very close parallels between Daniel 7, Matthew 24, 9 through 11, and Revelation 13, 11 through 17. And we'll look at those passages. Let's look specifically at Matthew 24, 9 through 11, since that's a, one of the main emphases in our study for today. Then you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and be put to death. All nations will hate you because of me, He's talking to the disciples. Many will give up their faith at that time. They will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 
okay? Terrible times, our persecution and deception are just before us. The devil would like to eliminate, this, this would be the devil's dream plan, eliminate all of God's faithful people from this earth and then turn to God and just say, okay, everybody left here on planet earth belongs to me. You can have the rest of the universe, but just leave this world and, and the people here to me and, and this will be my kingdom. And how does God respond to that? Sends Jesus. He sent Jesus, but not, even after Jesus came, what did he say? At the end of the book of Revelation, clear at the end of John's life, he said, not only are you not going to be allowed to have this earth as your future kingdom, I, God speaking, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters. So God says, Satan, sorry, you can't have this world, it's mine. So, Matthew 24, 13, but whoever holds out to the end will be saved. And then, Carrie, I think you have a comment for, like that from Ellen White. Right. Ellen White put it in these words, none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul will come the searching test, shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hour is even now at hand. Are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word? Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Comes from great controversy, controversy I'm sorry. Page 593, program, uh, paragraph 2, right through 594. Okay. So, are we, this will be the question, if we're really talking about preparing for the final events of this earth's history, are we grounding and fortifying our minds in preparation? Well, Jesus closed his Sermon on the Mount at the end of Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and following with these solemn words. So then anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain poured down, the rivers overflowed, and the wind blew hard against that house, but it did not fall because it was built on rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain poured down, the rivers overflowed, the wind blew hard against that house, and it fell. And what a terrible fall that was. And I, whenever I read those passages, I'm inclined to think of the children's song that says, you know, and they all came tumbling down, crash, you know. So, there's more to be done than just to intellectually, be intellectually aware of future events. We must live according to the instructions Jesus gave us. As noted below, below a, a casual reading of scripture will not save us or prepare us for the time when we will stand singly and alone. Jackie? Mm -hmm. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find, upon examining the positions they hold, that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance, and there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human in place of divine wisdom. Wow. Volume 5 of the Testimony, 707. That's a pretty stark statement, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look at Matthew 24, 15. You will see the awful horror, some translations have the abomination of desolation, of which the prophet Daniel spoke. It will be standing in the holy place. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Now there's something really important about this verse that we need to notice. Who's quoted, who's talking here? Jesus. Jesus. And he puts this statement 
past, present, or future? Future. You will see. What does that mean? Why is that important? Because most modern uh, interpreters interpret the uh, abomination of de desolation and all the Daniel texts that go with it as applying to, to Antiochus Epiphany uh, way back before Jesus. 165 years before Jesus. Well, before Jesus was born. Yeah. So they don't believe that even the Bible can predict the future. Not even God can yeah, predict that's the future. Right. Yeah. Well, what did Jesus say? So basically what we're saying then is that if you, if you uh, don't believe what, what, if you believe or you don't believe what Daniel said and you don't believe he can, God can predict the future, then you're, 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 you don't believe what Jesus says. So, and what do we know about Antiochus Epiphanes? Christians believe that these words were fulfilled, some Christians believe that these words were fulfilled in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 to 165 BC. Jesus stated that the fulfillment of these prophecies was still future in his day. And Dennis, I think you have some words about that? Yes, this is uh, uh, from the SDA Bible Dictionary and also in the commentary. Um, Various interpretations have been given to the abomination of desolation. Writing after AD 70, the Jewish historian Josephus applies the prophecies of Daniel relating to the abomination of desolation to Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who set out to obliterate every trace of the Jewish religion and who in the year 168 BC plundered the temple, suspended its services, and desecrated the altar of burnt offering by erecting an idol altar upon it, whereon he caused swine to be offered. This state of affairs continued for at least three full years until uh, Judas Maccabeus rallied his fellow Jews and repulsed the forces of Antiochus. Thereupon the temple was cleansed, the idol altar removed, a new altar erected in its place, and the daily sacrifice reinstituted. The writer of First Maccabees, probably 100 BC, who records the attempts of Antiochus to Hellenize the Jews and the various exploits of, the Ju of Judas Maccabeus and his successors, First uh, Maccabees uh, 1, 20 to 64, 4, 36 to 60, and 6, 7. Was apparently familiar with the book of Daniel. He does not state that these events are fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies, nor does he apparently apply any of the time periods to the persecution by Antiochus, for he stresses their duration as exactly three years. However, he uses the same Greek words for abomination, desolation, cleanse, daily, and other key expressions as appear in the Septuagint of Daniel, which is thought to have been translated uh, about uh, 150 BC, about the time these events occurred. Our Lord used the expression abomination of desolation with reference to the impending destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, Matthew 24, 15 to 20, and Luke 20, uh, 21, 20 to 24. Numerous Protestant interpreters understanding these prophecies of Daniel to refer to the uh, opposition of papal Rome to true Christians as well as that of pagan Rome toward the Jews have applied the abomination of desolation to such papal practices as the confessional and the sacrifice of the mass. Okay, well there's a lot of stuff there that's a little bit complicated, but basically what we're saying here is that even before Jesus came to this earth, there were people who wrote, extra-biblical people who wrote, and they wrote about these interpretations, apparently writing about these interpretations from Daniel, and they were, ha they were writing about them just shortly after Antiochus did his thing, and they don't mem to mention anything about Antiochus. But people who came along a long time later, what, what's that, 150 years later, said, well, maybe, so, who would know more about Antiochus Epiphanes, the guy who lived 20 years later or the guy who lived 200 years later? <laughs> Think about it. 
Well, when God spoke of an abomination of desolation or an awful horror, he was talking about things like idolatry, that's mentioned in Deuteronomy 27.15, or even immoral sexual practices, Leviticus 18.22. So in the context of Daniel and Matthew, certainly he was speaking about some sort of serious religious apostasy. And Gordon, I think you have a couple of comments about that. Luke 21.20 20 from the Good News Bible. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that it will soon be destroyed. And what do we know about, uh, just adding a little bit of something in there, what do we know about what Jesus told his disciples to do when they, the city was surrounded? To leave. Get out. He says, when you see the armies of Rome surrounding Jerusalem, get out. And what happened, do we know, in actual fact, AD 66? The armies came down there, they were surrounding Jerusalem, it looked like it was hopeless for Jerusalem, then all of a sudden, boom, they were gone. What happened? Why did they leave? Stuff was going on in Rome, wasn't there? Vespasian, Vespasian realized that the, the, that the emperor was dead, and he raced home to become the next emperor, so he took his armor with him. So there was four years went by, and then Vespasian's son, Titus, came back with an army, and by that time, of course, the Christians, the faithful Christians who believed Jesus' instructions were all left, and where did they go, do you know? Here's a little bit of trivia. Egypt. No, they didn't go to, the well, east. there were some in Egypt already, but where? The east went, they crossed the Jordan. They crossed the Jordan, and they went up close to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Pella, P-E-L-L-A, um, and they were safe there. Well, Matthew 24, 15, we've already looked at, but let's just look at it again real quick. You will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. It will be standing in the holy place. Note that we are to be sure to understand what this means. You will see. Okay, that was Jesus' words. Okay? Uh, clearly, he was looking forward to the more terrible and widespread destruction far in the future. And, Gordon, you have another comment about that? From Great Controversy, page 22. Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief and rebellion and hastening on to meet the retributive judgments of God. So, uh, does God make retributive judgments? Well, they're uh, retributive. Is what God into retribution? I don't think that, I think there's a better way of saying that. Yeah, well, there could, probably could be, yeah. Um, this is one of the earlier, or the very earliest of the big books that Ellen White wrote. It's a little more vindictive than some of her other books. Um, so what do we know about this abomination of desolation? What, anyone have any mar marvelous good light about it? Well, look at a couple of other places. Uh, I'm not sure this will help us, but Daniel 12, verse 11, from the time the daily sacrifices are stopped, that is, from the time of the awful horror, which is another word for the uh, uh, abomination of desolation, 1,290 days will pass, okay? <clears throat> don't know what for sure that means. Anybody all up to date on that? If we go back to chap the end of chapter 11, actually it's not the end of chapter 11, earlier in chapter 11, we read these words. Uh, 11.31. Was it 31? I'm sorry. I went past it here. Some of his soldiers will desecrate the temple. They will stop the daily sacrifice and set up the awful horror. So uh, you can see why many interpreters, even in our day, would say, that sounds a little bit like Antiochus Epiphanes. But what, what, what temple do we think Jesus was talking about? Heavenly. We, th we think that there's something going on in the heavenly sanctuary, don't we? Now, it's not going to be destroyed, but... Uh, Devil would like to, wouldn't he? We we know today that there are those Christians, there are Christians who uh, are identified in the book of Daniel as being a part of what we call the little horn. And they have set up what things? Alternative system of mediation and salvation, uh, where you confess your sins to other human beings, not directly to heaven, and you get forgiveness of your sins. You can even buy indulgences sometimes. Well, let's go back to Daniel 8, starting with verse 9. 
Look at, look at these words. Out of one of these four horns grew a little horn, whose power extends, extended towards the south and the east and towards the promised land. Okay, we, we don't have time to go into a detail of interpreting the book of Daniel, but southeast promised land are those, which direction are we spreading? I mean, in, we're spreading outwards, right? On this earth, that would be a horizontal spread, right? So it grew strong enough to attack the armies of heaven. Which direction is that? That's a vertical attack, isn't it? The, star, the stars themselves, and it threw some of them to the ground and trampled on them. It even defied the prince of the heavenly army, stopped the daily sacrifice offered to him, and desecrated the temple. Okay? These are complicated terms. What are we going to do with them? Does God just sit by and watch all this stuff being done by the little horn? No. Daniel 7. We can go back a chapter, start, verse, starting with verse 9. What is God going to do? While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. Now, one who was living forever, what would that be? Father. It would have to be God. His clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session and the books were opened. So how is God going to respond to these attempts to desecrate his plan? Well, he's going to uh, have everything out there. In other words, he's not back in some room making a decision and, and uh, saying this is what, you know, forcing his will. He's uh, making things very transparent. Okay. Now there's an interesting passage back in chapter 8, verse 14, that somehow fits here. I heard the other angel answer, it will continue for 2300 evenings and mornings, during which sacrifices will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. What does that mean? We, maybe we should look at one or look at it in a different translation. Let's try the King James, for example. And come on now, he's taking me to the wrong place. Well, okay, well, we'll try a different translation. Doesn't like that one for some reason. Okay. Oh, well. Excuse me for not pushing the right button. Here we go. Let's go here now. He said to me for uh, a, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. What does that mean? Put it in rightful state. Okay. Or vindicated, as the margin in New American Standard says. It says that even if we, if we go back in our parallel passage to Matthew 24, 29, look what that says. Soon after the trouble of those days, the sun will go dark, the moon will no longer shine, and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers in space will be driven from their courses. I mean, this, these final events are going to be connected with some pretty shocking things happening even in the sky, huh? Or is it, is it fair for us to say that something that happened 200 plus years ago is, is a sign of the end? What do you think? I think we've called it one of the earlier signs of the end. Yeah. Quite often. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Does that mean we're wrong? I don't think so. Okay. Well, uh, if you think in terms of the history of the world, we're talking thousands and thousands of years. The last 200 years is not such a long distance. Uh, yeah. For one person's lifetime, it might seem like a long time. Well, Jesus didn't just drop everything after warning all these, these things. He said, he, he came up with a couple of stories, a couple of parables, we call them. 
The first one is in Matthew 25, starting with verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there were ten young women who took their oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and the other five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any extra oil with them, while the wise ones took containers full of oil for their lamps. The bridegroom was late in coming, so the women began to nod and fall asleep. How many of the women began to nod and fall asleep? All, all, all of them. Ten. All of them. It was already midnight when the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come and meet him. The ten women woke up and trimmed their lamps. Then the foolish ones said to the wise ones, Let us have some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. No, indeed, the wise ones answered. There is not enough for you and for us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. So the foolish women went off to buy some oil, and when, while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived. The five who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was closed. Later the other women arrived. Sir, sir, let us in, they cried. Certainly not, I don't know you, the bridegroom answered. And Jesus concluded, be on your guard then, because you do not know the day or the hour. So what does that tell us about how to be prepared for the soon coming? Well, we, we need, need an oil. adequate... Huh? We need oil. We need oil? What does that tell us? What, what's the oil? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. And, how and they do all we... sought the Holy Spirit, didn't they? Yeah. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how do we get more of that oil? Spend more time. Yes. Could we say that some sought the Holy Spirit foolishly? while others sought the Holy Spirit wisely. That sounds like a good way to put it. There, there are a couple of very important things to notice, as we've already mentioned. All ten of them were sleeping. There was a delay. What does that tell us? We might expect to see a delay also. You know, if you look at the stories where God actively involves himself with human events, there are a lot of delays. Mm -hmm. Think of Abraham and Sarah. Did they think there was a delay? Oh, <laughs> you know, here's a healthy young couple. who We don't know what, what age they got married. Abraham was 75, and God says, I want you to go off to some place you've never seen before, take all your flocks and herds and your family and anybody else who will go with you and head off over there. And I will make that country a great land and kings will be there and all that kind of stuff. And Abraham says, hold on just a minute, God, I think you forgot something. I'm 75. I've been married for years and years and years. I have no descendants. I have no sons. And God says, I'll take care of that. So he waits until Sarah stops having her periods, and Abraham says, hmm, God seems to have forgotten his promise here. Let's see if we can fix things. And so there was Hagar. And God says, oh no, I haven't forgotten. It's not the plan. <laughs> Ninety years old. Was it Sarah somewhat involved in when she suggesting? Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> well, it turns out, if you go back and look at the the customs of the people in the area in southeastern Turkey where they came from, that was the custom. If a wife couldn't produce a, a son, she would get a surrogate. That was a standard procedure. So when she stopped having periods, it looked pretty permanent, didn't it? Anyway, there are lots of other delays in Old Testament times that we could mention. So will we be among those who are prepared by coming by carefully studying, storing up truth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Well, Fred, I think you've got a comment there. Yes, uh, this is a paragraph taken from uh, the writings of Ellen White, Crushed Object Lessons, page 411, paragraph 1, where she says, The class represented by the foolish vir virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. 
they have n not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. I'm sorry, to, I'm, I skipped a line here. No, you're right. No. Uh, you got it. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail uh, of the assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent, implementing in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. One, they do not know God. Two, they have not studied his character. Three, they have not held communion with him. Therefore, four, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Five, their service to God degenerates into a form. Wow. Christ's Object Lessons 411. Do we know any Christians in any churches that have uh, churches that are degenerated into forms? I'll let you think about that. How many aren't? How many aren't? <clears throat> I didn't want to say it like that. <laughs> oh, I, I asked. I didn't say. Yeah. Well, there's an awful lot of churches that this is a, here's the standard format. If someone tries to change the way you do things, oh boy, the, the, the stars fall, the sky, you know. Well, as of about uh, 17, 18 years ago, something like that, there was 33,000 Christian denominations around the world. 33,000, and there's probably more now. Yeah. A lot of those, of course, are single churches. Yeah, well, still, but they all have their ideas, yeah. Stories. Yeah. And within each church, there are different views. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this room, there are different views. That's right. Yes. True. Christian character is built by Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Are we faithfully doing all those things? We need to be witnesses not only by living true Christian lives, but also by being prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks us. And I think this is one of the areas where we, I, I had an interesting experience, I'll just tell you before I read this verse. I have a young lady that helps me at the clinic, uh, one of my medical assistants, a wonderful young woman, works hard, is so helpful, always pleasant, takes good care of the patients, etc. So, uh, we happened to mention something about the Bible and a conversation with one of the other ladies who was standing next to her. She says, well, I got a Bible once and I read a few pages. I couldn't understand a thing there, so I just threw it away. Can you imagine Jesus talking in a language that was four or five hundred years out of date? Yeah. He, he, he talked in a language that people could understand. Yeah. And then he, by that, he used even stories that, that people could relate to. Mm -hmm. And here we, we tell people, oh, you should uh, t study the King, use the King James, which is at least four, maybe 500 years uh, out of date. Yeah. Even with its updates. <laughs> it's, 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 he asked people to read things, and they come across a word. They don't know what it means. Yeah. Nobody's taught them how to read. The Bible, that is. Peter said, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. Are we ready to do that? I think especially of the <clears throat> three angels' messages. How many Adventists can clearly explain the three angels' messages? How about the first angel? How many of them really understand the first angel's message? The everlasting gospel. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 well, Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin. Well, that's not in there. And he, he, Jesus never said anything about it. Yeah. I was thinking about the, the lady in your office. Mm -hmm. She wants to meet Jesus. That's why she opened that Bible. Mm -hmm. And she didn't find him. Yeah. But you have got access mm -hmm. to great uh, that she could meet Jesus. Yep. And... Uh, 
so it, well I, I purchased a Bible for her good I haven't given it to her yet I'm waiting for what I hope will be the perfect time yeah. but it's going to come soon Maybe well, not overwhelm her, but give her a gospel of the John, of John in a language that's easy to read. Uh, that would be a good place to start if it piques her interest. I mean, that book of John is so powerful. Yeah. I've seen uh, story, read stories about Muslims mm -hmm. who hated Christians, read that, and 180 degrees, they yeah. they repented, they changed their whole direction in life. Okay, well, there was a second parable, Matthew 25, starting with verse 13. And I'm going to, I'm watching the clock there. I think I'll just summarize this. You know the story of the parable of the three servants, the talents. The wise man, this owner, owner apparently wealthy owner, was going away. So he gave a large sum of money, ten talents to one person that he really trusted. And then two, I mean five talents to that person. Then he gave two talents to another one. And then a third one that he didn't, wasn't too sure about, he gave one talent. And what happened? He was gone for quite a while. And the guy who was given five came back. The guy came back and he said, here's ten talents. And the guy had two. When he came back, he said, here's four. See, these guys had doubled their money, his money. And he went to the third one, and what had he done? Nothing. Nothing. Put it in the ground. Went out and buried it in the ground, said, here's your money back, take it. I have in my margin that I wrote that the 5,000 gold coins was the equivalent of about $2 million dollars. So the one talent was not a meager sum. No. That was a lot of money. Yep. Yep, it the, was. The way I read that text, I think he, he was given five talents of truth and well, multiplied by studying and reached the point where we had ten. Another also doubled the amount of truth that he had understood. Well, the one who had very little truth thought he had it all and didn't need to study to find more truth. He could put it in the ground for later use. Yeah. Well, and unfortunately, uh, and that's quite a bit of what, what we're going to talk about in the rest of our lesson, a lot of people think, well, because I'm not a pastor, because I don't have spiritual training, etc., you know, there's not really anything for me to do. And I've mentioned this story before, but I'll mention it again right now. Many years ago, I spent a, a little while working as a call porter. And the guy that was sort of directing us, helping us out and get, getting us started and so forth, told a story about an old man who was nearly blind. And this old man would go down the street, and probably it was safer in those days than it would be now, but he would go down the street and he'd knock on people's door and he would say, excuse me, but I'm blind, I can't read. I have this book here, would you be willing to read me a chapter out of this book? And he would take Desire of Ages, he would take Great Controversy, and guess who was by far the best soul winner in that whole church? Oh. He was. <laughs> yeah. He, he would. had an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> he was almost blind, right? <laughs> Great. He had a huge talent. He was almost blind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pretty sad story. I wonder how many of us are prepared to do anything. Um, what parallels do you see between these two, these two parab parables? Parallels between two parallel parables in Matthew 25? They're both clearly talking about some kind of a future event that's going to be a, a judgment kind of event, right? Where, where there, something's going to happen and you have to be ready, right? Obviously, it's the wise. Mm -hmm. The wise are going to discover more truth. Mm -hmm. Those who have more talents discover more truth. And uh, those who don't have a whole lot think they have it all, so why bother with finding more truth? So how do we, how do we discover and find more truth in 2018? Study, study, study. And like our life depends on it. And give us what we have. If we only harbor it and, and uh, ruminate in ourselves and don't give it, then it'll, it'll turn to dust. We have to be able to go out there and share and uh, we'll meet challenges, but then that we come back to, to the Lord and say, uh, what, what else? Mm -hmm. you know, how can I meet this need? And then he sends us out 
uh, refreshed again, and there's that ongoing cycle that uh, helps with our growth. A friend of mine, um, who unfortunately has passed now, uh, once said, if the, your picture of God hasn't changed in the last year, you're worshiping a graven image. Uh -huh. It's idolatry. False yeah. concept of God is the idolatry. Well, what do we know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The spiritual gifts, what we sometimes call the spiritual gifts. There's places, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 talks a lot about them. Ephesians 4. Let me just read Ephesians 4, we'll just, just to give you an idea what some of these spiritual gifts are. I can get my computer to... Okay, it was he who gave gifts. Here we are, Ephesians 4, starting with verse 11. He appointed some to be apostles. Uh, what would be a... Do we have any apostles today? Well, any of you are apostles? Apostle means to be sent. Okay. Uh, I heard somewhere that at the time they, it had, well, I think they were relating it to fulfilling Judas's post, you know, somebody who had been with them and had seen Jesus, so. Well, the, what, you're, it, somebody you're, who's sent. Okay, so, it, can, you, you know what that word would, what that, mes, what the, me, that idea would be in a different language? I was kind of making a strange Missionary. point. Missionary. Missionary. So, apostle is Greek, missionary is Latin, same word. Someone who's sent on a mission is a missionary. Someone who's sent on a mission is an apostle, apostello, sent out to and do something. In Hebrews, Jesus is called the apostle, the yeah. one that was God sent. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So we have apostles, prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's <coughs> full stature. That's quite a, a challenge. Are we ready for that? Well, God has promised that those who faithfully use the talents he has given them, given them will be rewarded with additional talents. Those who do not use their talents are described by Jesus as wicked and lazy in the New King James Version. Well, we may feel that we have not been given any major talents, but what does God tell us? Jim? It was the one with the smallest gift who left his talent unimproved. And this is, a, and this is given a warning to all who feel that the smallness of their endowments excuses them from service for Christ. If they could do something great, how gladly would they undertake it? But because they can serve only in little things, they think themselves justified in doing nothing. In this they err. The Lord in his distribution of gifts is testing character. The man who neglects to improve his talent proves himself an unfaithful servant. He had received five talents. He would have buried them, excuse me, if he had, no, had he received five talents, he would have buried them as he buried the one. His misuse of the one talent showed that he despised the gift of, gifts of heaven. He that is faithful in that which is the least is faithful also in much, Luke 16.10. The importance of the little things is often underrated because they are small. But they supply much of the actual discipline of life. There are no real non-essentials in the Christian life. Our character building will be full of peril while we underrate the importance of the little things. Ellen White's Christ Object Lessons, page 355-356. Wow. Well, could our foolishness, you know this word we've been using, of, as virgins, assuming we're all in that category, delay the coming of the Lord? Well, in the context of the parable, I don't know that their action delayed. Uh, they, yeah. they just. Uh, you I'm, know, I'm asking us to think outside of the parable here. Well, in in our in our times, have we delayed the coming of the Lord? Well, and White says we have. Yeah. Only 170 years or so. That's all. Yeah, no problem. In a way, that shows how gracious God is, isn't it? Yeah. How he patient and and uh, that he is with us. Mm-hmm. 
Well, look at a few verses on that subject. Matthew 24, 23 through 25 and verse 31. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ, um, let me just click this, and false Christ and false messiahs will appear, they will perform great miracles and wonders if, or, in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Listen, I have told you this before the time comes. Dropping down to verse 31, the great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Now, I don't know. I just throw in a little other thing on the side here. Have any of you heard discussions about how we're going to tell between the false Christ and the true Christ when he comes? Yes. And I've heard people tell me, well, the difference is that the real Jesus, when he comes, his feet won't touch the ground. So they're focusing on the feet. I have a, I have a message for those people. Read carefully the descriptions in the Bible and in Ellen White about exactly what happens at that moment, the entire sky is going to be full of bright shining angels. The devil will never be, and, Jesus, and it says specifically, he will not be allowed to duplicate the manner of Christ coming. So if you don't see the sky full of angels, relax. It's not the real Jesus. Okay, now maybe I shouldn't say relax, that's maybe not the right thing to do, but at least you know it's not Jesus coming. Fortify yourself ahead of time with some words of truth. Right. <laughs> Romans eight thirty three. Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. And finally, one more passage, Colossians three twelve. Um, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you to be his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So in these passages, God speaks about each of us as members of his chosen people. Is that what he means in Matthew 24 when he talks about God's elect? What does elect mean? Called. Chosen. Chosen. chosen, yeah. It's a good parallel, chosen. So God can or will take to heaven only his faithful chosen ones who do what he has asked them to do. Why is that? Because they they'll, be ha they'll be happy and people who don't want to do God's will will not be happy. It would be hell for them. Yeah, well, I mean, what would happen if you just took all the unprepared people from here to heaven? The great controversy would just continue, wouldn't it? Right. You haven't gained anything. In fact, you'd have it worse if, you, if the people go to heaven and live forever. You've just perpetuated the great controversy forever. Well, it probably be, wouldn't last forever because God in his, would just ultimately let evil run its course and, and it would all collapse. Yeah, among, probably. You know. Are we getting prepared? You out there, are you getting prepared? Are we fully aware of the details of the prophetic calendar? Have we recognized the signs of the end? Are we fully aware of Satan's deceptions? Are we still sleeping? What should we be doing in our personal lives to prepare for his coming? What should we be doing to help prepare others for his coming? Are we doing anything to help, to help others? Repeatedly, we have been warned that a time of shaking and persecution is coming. The devil will shake out everyone who he possibly can. Are we seeking first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33? Well, we can't be scared into preparing ourselves. Ellen White said in one place, the shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and to make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. It is necessary that the ter is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us to fear to right action? This ought not to be Jesus is attractive. That's found in Review and Herald, August 2, 1881. That was, what, three days or something like that before James White died. Do you ever feel like Adventists have been crying wolf, wolf for so long that nobody believes us anymore? Gordon has already suggested we're 173 years after the Great Disappointment in 1844. Well, one of the challenges is how do you reach out to other people? And Jesus gave a great example on several occasions by introducing 
things he wanted to say by asking questions. It's, that's a great way. Ask people questions and see how they respond. And often that will open the door for you to say something important. We know that a terrible time is coming. Matthew 24, 15 to 28 talks about horrible stuff that's coming. Uh, the disciples that Jesus was speaking to at the time thought that the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem would be connected with the end of the world. But uh, he goes on in, in Revelation and talks about the, well, it, well, it talks about the finishing of the work. I guess that's it, the, Genesis 2-2, two, two, the, finish the finishing of creation work. Exodus 40, verse 30, talks about the finishing of the first sanctuary. And then 1 Kings 7, 40 and 51, talks about the finish of Solomon's temple. Do these, does the expression abomination of desolation or awful horror used by Daniel in Daniel 9:27 and 12:11 apply only to the destruction of Jerusalem? Or could this apply to some event still in the future? Gary, I think we've got about enough time for you to read another passage there. All right. <clears throat> the Jews had forged their own fetters. They had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance in the utter destruction that befell them as a nation and in all the woes that followed them in their dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown. Says the prophet, O Israel, Thou hast destroyed thyself, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. That came from Hosea 13.9 and Hosea 14.1. Their sufferings are often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permit, permitted, rather, to rule them according to his will. The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are as demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. Great controversy, 35 and 36, and we're running out of time with that, but I hope that this lesson has challenged you to think about how you are going to prepare yourself for the second coming. Our kind and loving Father, we have plenty of warning, not only from Scripture, but with the help of Ellen White as well. We know that some very serious times are coming. We're starting to see the winds of, t of strife blow on our earth. We, th we see wars happening all around us. There are many reasons to believe that the time can't be far off. Help us to be prepared is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.